Welcome to Kambali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, excite and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from 29th of October until the 8th of November. Kambali, the Indonesian word for return or come back, and it represents, in our case, the revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia and all over the world at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connections is more important than ever. So today I'm very excited to be introducing you to James Osland. James Osland is the author and editor-in-chief of World Food by 10 Speed Press, a book series that explores the planet's greatest food destinations. From 2006 to 2014, James was the editor-in-chief of the US food magazine Saveur and his memoir and cookbook Cradle of Flavor in 2006 received accolades from the James Beard Foundation and the International Association of Culinary Professionals. It was named one of the best books of 2006 by the New York Times, Time Asia and Good Morning America. His writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Gourmet, Vogue, and dozens of other media outlets. He was a judge from 2009 to 2013 on the Bravo television series, Top Chef Masters. And in 2019, James published his memoir, Jimmy Neurosis. Welcome, James, to our session today. Buenas tardes from Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's very impressive. So James, uh, really excited to be featuring you today in our program. So first of all, we need to know a little bit more about you though, because you've had the most extraordinary um, career from uh, acting, etc. and then to food and writing and all that. So tell us a bit about yourself and, and uh, the early days, the early James. Ah, what a nice thing for you to say. <laughs> I, you know, I was born um, in the early 1960s in what is now Silicon Valley, but was back then called Santa Clara Valley. And in fact, it was an agricultural area. And my, my parents, um, they had their first house there that they owned. My dad was an office product salesman. And so I grew up largely in California. And, um, you know, at a certain point for a variety of reasons, I made a little bit of a left turn and I was kind of a bad kid. And in fact, I um, dropped out of high school and, the book you just mentioned, my memoir, Jimmy Neurosis, is an accounting of that very transformational, fun, and really ultimately rather wonderful period of my life. It's a very positive book. Um, but I was an American, tried and true. And I only lived on American soil. I only knew American culture. And when I was 17 years old, I had the great opportunity to travel outside of the United States for the first time. My dad and I, and I still to this day do not know how I did this, but I convinced him to take this road trip from New Orleans, where he was living, all the way to the southernmost point of Mexico, right next to the wow. Guatemala border. And so we drove in his very um, precarious uh, station wagon that broke down two times on that trip. It was a three week trip, but um, it changed my life. You know, that trip, it was the first time that I had experienced anything that wasn't what I was accustomed to. And it, it just, it, it's like it, it flipped on a switch. My mind opened up and everything I saw, smelled, heard, and tasted just began to just change me. And all of a sudden I was aware there's this world out there. There's this exciting, amazing world out there. There's not just this thing that I know. And um, shortly thereafter, I made my um, second international trip when I was 19 years old to Indonesia. 
And um, I ended up staying the better part of a year. I had been in college at the time. And boy, that was the beginning of, of something entirely yes. special and wonderful. <laughs> so, so, um, so when you went to Indonesia, you planned to stay a short time, yeah? I had planned to just stay for really probably a few weeks, but I hadn't sorted it out. I was invited mm -hmm. by a classmate um, from college, from art school in San Francisco, who was Indonesian. And she very casually asked me, you know, oh, do you want to come visit me and my family this summer break? And I think she probably wasn't fully expecting me to say, okay, I'm getting my plane ticket and I'm coming. <laughs> But um, I, I, I ended up coming a few weeks later and I was so, you know, Janet, I was just so spellbound by mm. that, that initial experience that I had yeah. to stay on. You stayed for a year. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, so when you stay, this is, so, uh, for those who don't know, you're talking about Tanya Alwi, who's also a friend of mine. And her father, Des Alwi, is named the unofficial king of Bandanera, which is sort of my Indonesian home away from home. So you must have known Des. Oh, I knew Tanya's dad very, very well. But, wow. you know, my knowledge about Indonesia and about this place that I was going was so unbelievably limited, you know, <laughs> before I went. I only had a faint notion of where it was located, you know, on the map. And, mm -hmm. you know, after, you know, I'd sort of made up this idea, I'm going, I'm going, and, you know, like it or not, Tanya, I, ready your place, here I come, I began to slowly familiarize myself with more about the place and what I didn't realize about Tanya, because she was just a classmate of mine, I thought, wow, Yay. how fantastic. But what I didn't realize was how important her father was to the history of Indonesia. In fact, I mean, he's really considered, you know, one of, one of the founding voices of the country yeah. back, back in the mid 1940s. And so I had, you know, just this great advantage <laughs> of being this kid from suburban California who was in art school, but got invited to Indonesia by this That's important amazing. person. <laughs> mm -hmm. It did, um, you know, I love Bandanera. Did you ever get to Bandanera or the Malukus? Did you go there? Oh, I've been a number of times. And, you know, as you yeah. just as you just said, you almost tore the words out of my own heart. You know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's very special to me, as is the mm -hmm. whole country of Indonesia. It yeah. just means so much to me, that place. So we were talking the other day about Jakarta back in the day, which I'm, I'm a newbie when it comes to Jakarta. Tell us, so what was that like for you back then? So this was all unfolding, everything that I've just been describing, the early 1980s. So it wasn't exactly the year of, year of living dangerously. It was, you know, in fact, <laughs> 20 years later. But yeah. it was a very different Jakarta than it is now. And, you know, so many of us um, who really love that city talk about this, but it was Yay. basically just villages right next to each other. It was sort of like a gigantic Javanese city, just full of these winding crisscrossing lanes and, um, you know, and these low slung buildings. And it was just, it was just absolutely magic. Street vendors everywhere, just a kind of constant cacophony and sound and mm -hmm. smell and experience. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, um, it, be, it started to become a very different city in the late 1980s, but some yeah. of us pine for <laughs> yes. Well, certainly they say if you want to try Indonesian food from across the archipelago, just go to Jakarta, yeah? Yes, absolutely. And the same could be said of where I live now in Mexico City. You know, these, these yeah. are both melting pot cities of these, um, you know, sprawling and very complicated nations. Yeah, so um, we'll get back to that. But actually, so when you finally did leave Jakarta after a year, what did you do after that? <laughs> well, I went back into college. You know, I picked up where I left off. I was a filmmaker and yeah. I, I was making short films, short experimental films. Um, and, you know, it was something that, that, that I loved very much and was 
you know, really my first creative outlet in life was being a filmmaker. And mm, it, 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 it tuned me into something that I could do, you know, some things that I could make and then show other people and exchange and all of that, just basically the act of creation. And, um, you know, so all, all along, I, um, you know, one thing that neither of us has mentioned just yet is a baseline that was always there. The year that I was in Indonesia, in my travels in Mexico before then, and then after I'd come back from Indonesia is I was a cook. I was somebody who was always, wow. always yes. interested in food. Yeah, and okay. Mm -hmm. And that was always there, really kind of at the top of the, at the, top of the list. My dad um, was a terrific cook. My mom, not so much, but, but <laughs> grew up yeah. eating really, really excellent food. And from a very young age, probably I was like mm -hmm. seven or eight years old yes. when I started cooking. I was always interested in the activity of cooking and understanding ingredients and the amazing alchemy and transformation that happens to those ingredients in, in the pan. And so my experience in Mexico first opened me up to this other world that wasn't supermarkets and yeah. frozen food, the frozen food that my mom made. And then my, dad, <laughs> yeah. my dad never opened frozen food. Never did that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My mom had a thing for that, but it made sure yeah. it was. But, yeah. um, you know, and then when I traveled to Indonesia and here I was in this, as I was describing, you know, this giant village of Jakarta and it was, you know, just such a noisy, confusing and in so many ways, a place that I didn't understand. How I began to understand that place was through its food and cooking. And in fact, I mean, hours, days I spent in the family kitchen in the Aoi's house, just, you know, mm -hmm. sprawled out on the floor with the, with the ladies who were, you know, just constantly cooking in that house and exposing me to new ingredients, new tastes, new smells. I mean, just this really exciting, exciting world mm -hmm. that began to translate Indonesia for me and translate Jakarta for me. I couldn't necessarily yeah. understand it in other ways, in other terms. Okay. I didn't understand the language yet, although in the kitchen, I was beginning to pick it up. Yeah. And, you know, through that experience, that's where I fell in love with Indonesia. And that's where it began to make yeah. sense <laughs> to me here. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, yeah. every, every time I taste that food now, I'm brought back to, you know, just the wonderful, wonderful layers of experience that I have in this place that I love so much. Um, I'll, I'll get back to Mexico because that's obviously a big part of your life. But I, I just want to know um, about Savo. I mean, you really, really took that to um, amazing levels, you know, the, the success and the, um, I mean, as it says, the subscription renewal rate, rates were among the highest in Amer American magazine history when you took over the, the realms of uh, Saver. Can you tell us about that experience? Well, you know, Saver is a, it's an, it's an American food magazine. And, you know, a shorthand way of describing it is it's kind of like the National Geographic of food. It, it, it tells about culture through, you know, food and ingredients. And so for me, it was always an, a, mag a magazine that I was in love with. I mean, my goodness, I saw the very first issue and, and, yeah, yeah. and before me in 1994, I held in my hands a magazine, the likes of which I'd never seen before. It was like my, my partner at the time, he said, this is your magazine. This is like what you do. <laughs> And so I, I, you know, I admired the magazine for a number of years. I honestly, you know, this is years and years and years and years before the internet and social media and all of that. And here was this print publication that I admired so much that I didn't want to wreck it by being a part of it. I just wanted to admire how well done it was. And so after about four years of reading it, I, you know, I finally realized, you know, this, this doesn't make sense anymore. I need to be contributing stuff to Saber. And so I wrote a pitch to the executive editor of the magazine, and I heard nothing for an entire year, like complete radio silence. 
<laughs> and after a year, I thought, you know what? Maybe they didn't get my first mail because it was a typed letter. It wasn't an email. And I sent the exact same letter again. And within a couple of days of sending that, the executive editor phoned me and said, you know, we actually got your letter a year ago, but we've just been really busy. So do you want to come <laughs> in and meet everybody? And from that moment on, I, I became a Sever contributor for about, mm -hmm. um, well, almost uh, nearly a decade. I wrote oh, and, and photographed articles yes, for Sever yeah, all, yeah. all, all over the world. And out of that wrote a wrote a book about Indonesia, my 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 real deep uh, food love of back then, the place that I understood the most outside of the United States, and that book was published in 2006. And right at that time, um, the editor in chief. Of, of the magazine um, was outgoing. And so I stepped in and that's how that happened. That's I basically, wow. people think I'm, I'm, this is like a line that I'm saying, but it really <laughs> isn't a joke where I went from backpacker to magazine editor in chief, <laughs> just basically kind of like that. <laughs> people who know that's me good. that know it's the complete truth. <laughs> that's hilarious. So, I mean, you, you, as I said, you had extraordinary success. You really turned it around. Um, what was your own personal vision for the magazine? Was that kind of driving you towards this success? Well, you know, that's very nice of you to say, but I think that the formula of Sever back then, the one I inherited, it worked so well, and I understood it so well as a contributor. I basically just, you know, I, 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 car I, carried, I carried on with its original mission. It was something that was so familiar to me. And I think that, you know, what we provided and what I, you know, um, providing with my new book series world food is a it's a it's a continuation of that idea of representing human truth through its recipes and the way the way humanity eats and so i've just always believed if you if you stick really close to that and your mission is really true and you're you're you you you're you're following through with as much integrity as you can possibly muster and you're really representing as a journalist the 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 food cultures of the world all over the world then yeah. you know then you're it's my belief is much as you try to stay close to that you're you're doing you're doing good work yeah. hopefully yeah. knock on word wood on a <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um what was your crowning achievement for Sever? Was this, you know, a particular story or edition that you felt you really excelled? You know, really honestly, it was the 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 feedback that we would get from readers and yeah. uh, they would, you know, they would reveal how much they were touched by, yeah. you know, by, by what we'd labored over because we were a very small staff. We were, you know, everybody thought we had these gigantic budgets and oh no, yeah. <laughs> sometimes at three o'clock yeah. in the morning taking photographs with my iPhone because we had to go to the printer like within 45 yeah. minutes. And so <laughs> no, it wasn't it wasn't exactly yeah. there was no there was no van mm -hmm. of makeup artists coming through to make sure we were <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cute. it that's was cute. it was the it was the feedback though of, yeah. of mm -hmm. um, you know of, of of our readers. That was very yeah. meaningful. Actually with your cookbook too, I'm I'm really lucky to to have that. And what I loved about it is the fact that uh, you, you knew that you knew what you were talking about and you must have got a lot of positive feedback over that too. You know, I loved writing that book. I mean, yeah. it was one of, the, one of the most wonderful things I've ever done. Mm. It took about yeah. six hard years of work. Wow. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I really wanted it to honor mm. the cuisines of Indonesia and mm -hmm. also honor Indonesian culture, which in the United States is fairly unknown, which is curious because Indonesia is just, well, it's just such an important, you know, fascinating yeah. place. And it's the world's fourth largest nation, you know, but I really wanted to portray this place that was 
so meaningful in my own transformation and my own mm -hmm. understanding of the world. Um, it's a place I'm, I'm, I'll always be indebted to because what it showed me at, at such an early age, I wanted to convey that to my reader by way of recipes that I acquired along the way, mostly from grandmothers in, in village yeah. kitchens or Tanya's family or, yeah, you know, base, I, really yeah. wanted to, I wanted it to be an authentic snapshot of place through mm -hmm. its great yeah. dishes. Fantastic. So um, tell us about your current project for which you're in Mexico and how long have you been researching there? So I've had this lifelong dream going back to, you I know, to, for what it be. Yeah. I've, I've yeah. had this lifelong, are we good? We're good. <laughs> There's some weird feedback. So Janet froze. I've got frozen Janet face. That area just, just kind of bit, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like that in and out. Yeah. Um, here, it's not here. Here, it's not here. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's kind of crazy. What are the Wi-Fi guide gods that we should be, you know, supplicating? I know, I know. I'm oh, oh, making more offerings too, don't you think? <laughs> Please let me know. Please let I know. me know. Track the code. <laughs> Sorry, do we, yeah. shall we? Yeah. Where, where, where um. Okay. So. Um, oh, so the let's. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. So. Um, Tell us about Mexico when you're there now, you've um, started this amazing series and you obviously really love Mexico. So first off, how long have you been there? And tell us about the researching of the food, et cetera, for the recipes. Well, I've been in Mexico City now a little over four years and I'm starting, you know, really what is for me, I mean, Gosh, I don't want to jinx it by saying so, but I, I feel so strongly about it. It really is my, I feel like this is my life's work. This, it's, a, it's an idea that I've had all the way since I was a child, um, you know, going to the library in California with my mom and checking out these books from the library that were called Foods yeah. of the World. It was a Time Life book series. And yeah, so I encountered I these yeah. books over kind of half cookbooks. They were, you know, a lot of information about the cultures of the place, beautiful, very transportive photographs. And, and these were just marvelous books that were really, they, they just really opened my eyes and made me so excited about the world that lay beyond. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a lifelong mm -hmm. dream yeah. to sort of pay homage, I guess, to this series by creating mm -hmm. my own series. I'm someone who's traveled basically everywhere in the world. Yeah. And to, you know, know its cuisines and their differences and their interconnectedness in, in a special way. And so mm -hmm. I've had this dream all along to make a book series. And so when I left the magazine world about five years ago, I had the idea to embark on it. And so I um, came up with a proposal and the first book in the series was about Mexico City, the mm -hmm. first place where I had really had a kind of epiphany about food that wasn't what I was used to eating. And so me and uh, the, the really excellent photographer, Jim Roper, came down to Mexico City for four months to photograph the book. Wow. And so we, we, the, books, the book series is, is, is largely about traditional cooking in the best places all over the world. And so Mexico City is number one. And I thought, you know, for me, the truest sense of the cuisine here is found in people's homes. This yeah, is where you really taste yeah. what Mexico City tastes like. Sure, there's mm -hmm. really excellent um, high-end restaurants here. There's fantastic street food. And those things are represented in this volume. But I thought, we've got to get inside of people's homes to really mm -hmm. understand these ingredients, to really understand how they're handled, what the techniques are, and to really understand the soul of Mexico City. And like yeah. we were talking about earlier with Jakarta, in Mexico City, you've got an amalgam of the entire nation of Mexico 
here. Mm -hmm. You've got like the cooking of the Yucatan, you've got the cooking of the great state of Michoacan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all found here. And so I wanted this book to convey that, the yeah. melting pot aspect of Mexico City. So as I said, we shot it for four months and wow. then we shot the next volume, which is about Paris. And that book will be coming out um, next fall, next November. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I was falling back in love with Mexico City, a place that I've been to 30 times since I was 17 years old. And I thought, <laughs> wait, why don't I live here? Yes. New York is great and everything, <laughs> but I'm not being a magazine editor anymore. Yes. Mm -hmm. let's, let, let's live in Mexico City. And so I got an apartment and you know, we uh -huh. developed recipes for the Mexico yeah. City volume and also for the Paris mm -hmm. volume here, me and me and this wonderful team of Mexican ladies wow. that I work with. And, yeah. you know, hey, I've got, you know, mangoes and guavas and papayas and a beautiful plaza. And I look out on a convent that goes back to wow. the 1500s. You know, it's just yeah. right there, yards away. Mm -hmm. And I feel so mm -hmm. lucky to be in such an old grounded yes. place. I mean, what a mm. remarkable place. It feeds me. And so that's how yeah. I ended up here. <laughs> wow. we, I mean, we were talking about um, the fact that uh, Mexico and Indonesia is so old, but you said at the same time, they both absorb new ingredients so easily. And that's kind of morphed the food in different directions, I guess. You know, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I've, I've lived and traveled lots of places on earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, what comes to mind is I lived in India for a number of years and mm -hmm. India is a marvelous culinary destination. Truly, mm -hmm. truly, truly one of the greatest on earth, but yeah. India is a place that is set in its ways. And then I think of Indonesia and I think of Mexico and what you've got in both places, strangely, coincidentally, are these places that almost unlike many, many, most other places on earth, they absorb what comes from the outside and make it their own. And so what you've got in both places, and well, I can focus on Mexico, is yeah. just this fantastic, ancient melting pot of things merging together. You, you, mm -hmm. you know, you've got, when, when you eat almost anything, even in contemporary Mexico City, you've got dishes that can trace their roots back thousands of years to pre-Hispanic Mexico, mm. when it wasn't called yeah. Mexico, when it was nations yeah. of indigenous people, you know, because Mexican culture goes back, mm -hmm. well, I mean, a yeah. long, mm -hmm. long, long time. Yeah. But then mm -hmm. you've got, on top of that, dishes that incorporate modern ingredients, modern things, relatively mm -hmm. modern, like olive oil or cheese yeah. or even yeah. onions, which aren't native yeah. to here, because what is native to here is chilies and chocolate and, well, countless other things, but yeah. not mm -hmm. all of them. And so, yeah. you know, every time you eat anything here, there's this almost kind of electrical charge of connection <laughs> between all of these layers of information. And it's really a thrilling thing. Something that I, I hope, with any luck, I was able to capture a I'm little sure, bit. I'm sure, because your writing is so fantastic and exciting. I'm sure we'll get that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what about, um, you know, you were talking about traditional recipes and uh, the authentic food. How did you select which ones? Were you keeping in mind your audience that might have limited access to ingredients or limited experience cooking? You know, I always really want readers to get in the kitchen with the recipes mm -hmm. that I provide. And so always my goal is to translate to readers really how to authentically capture the taste mm -hmm. of Mexico, even not with, you know, a, 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 a proper Mexican equipment, but with just mm -hmm. whatever they have in the kitchen, even if it's just a Teflon pan. 
So that's something I've always been interested in my work, really going back decades when I did Cradle of Flavor, the, the, the Indonesia book. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly with the Mexico City volume and the entire series, my, my, my most important, my most urgent work is, and joyous work too, yeah. is to convey to the reader, this is how this place tastes. And you yeah. can taste it in your own kitchen, wherever you are. What mm -hmm. a joy and glory is that human exchange. Yeah. Yeah, true, true. Yum. <laughs> um, so moving on to the process of writing, uh, how do you sort of start uh, getting into a story? Do you have to have your favourite pot of tea there? Or, uh, yeah, what, what is it that sort of gets you going? Because you do it so well, but what are your tips? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, you know, and um, I also have the great, you know, <laughs> luck to, to work with co uh, marvelous co-conspirators and editors as well. But I'll tell you my process, Janet, when I come to a new place, and even when we started the World Food Mexico City volume, sure, it was a city that I knew very well because I'd been here so many times. I was deeply familiar with it all the way going back literally 40 years. Mexico City has been a part of my life since the first time I came here with my dad. But I really wanted to approach it with new fresh eyes for this particular volume, which I wanted to be a snapshot of place of Mexico City now as it is connected to its past. And what a what wonderful, eloquent articulation of that is found in its best dishes. Mm. And so, you know, when we came here, it was kind of a blank slate, even though I knew people and I, you know, I, I could have gone to places and restaurants that I was familiar with. I wanted to just approach it new and blank, really almost as a, an objective yeah. journalist, somebody who could just like come in and see it with fresh eyes. And so, you know, as I was mentioning, it was a four month process. And what I did was I just started finding home cooks through friends of friends or even people I would sometimes meet in markets who were determined to show me their grandmother's think, yeah. favorite dish mm -hmm. that was something yeah. that was very important to them. And mm -hmm. so slowly but surely we you know, found ourselves me and Jim, the photographer, in kitchens all over Mexico City, in fancy neighborhoods and humble neighborhoods. Yeah. For goodness, the wow. opening essay in the in the piece is I'm sorry, in the book, the opening piece in the book is is about um, a really wonderful home cook who I had the great luck to meet early on in our research process, a woman mm -hmm. named Senora Vicky, and she's a cleaning lady by trade, she <laughs> actually holds down three jobs. She puts in about 16 hour days and she's in her mid sixties. And she wow. lives in a, two, in a very tiny two room apartment in the neighborhood of Tepito, which is just north of the center of Mexico, Mexico City. Okay. And is often thought of, frankly, as one of the most dangerous neighborhoods. Oh, really? <laughs> and you know, the, yeah. the hardship that wonderful yeah. Senora Vicky has known mm -hmm. in her life along with her family who lives yeah. there are nine people living in these two rooms wow god yeah she cooks the most marvelous food and she invited mm -hmm. us with such warmth and genuineness yeah. into yeah. her home to share food that she had made for us and of it was such yeah. transformative, delicious, new yet old, marvelous, heartfelt food that, mm -hmm. you know, it was just this amazing, amazing, you know, moment and exchange. And my duty as the creator of this book and of this book mm -hmm. series is to convey yeah. the genuineness and beauty of being invited into Senora Vicky's home and, you know, allow, allow, it's a sacrament. It's a sacrament. Yeah, true. So you mean we have some of her recipes in your 
Mexican yes. book, and you're oh, how exciting, <laughs> Senora Vicky, and many, many other wonderful senoras and senoritas. Like I was had wow. the great fortune to find just just incredible contributors, and you know. Yeah, it was it was a joyous, joyous, joyous process. I mean, really cool, really so, fun. So they must a bit like here. They must really love it when you really love what they're producing or creating. Hey, what cook anywhere in the world does not <laughs> enjoy it when the person who's eating their food doesn't love it? I mean, yeah. that, like, yeah, that is I one know. of the most wonderful and essential human things, mm -hmm. you know, that yeah. moment. Uh -huh. it, that's, you know, that's, that's bonding right there. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, that's the idea. So, the series yeah. is that, you know. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I mean, we talked about um, the other day. I'm not that uh, familiar with authentic Mexican food. I mean, how different is the kind of Tex-Mex to the kind of food that you have experienced in Mexico? It's very different. Tex-Mex is fantastic. I mean, I, yeah. I love it. Like, there's no tomorrow. And when I yeah. get that version of this very, very... Yeah. American or food yeah. mm. uh, cuisine, then okay. you know yeah. I, I consider that context. Yeah. But real mm -hmm. Mexican mm -hmm. food, and certainly what one encounters in Mexico City, is a, a very, very, very different thing. Different it's a thing, food yeah. based on ancient ingredients, mostly. Mm -hmm. Chiles, chiles, as they're called here, Chile. which yeah. are a very, very different thing, you know, than you know in Indonesia, where you know maybe four or five or six varieties of chilies in Bali mm -hmm. and in the surrounding islands. But here yeah. in Mexico, where chilies are indigenous, there are literally hundreds <laughs> of varieties <laughs> because. You know, this, this magical, Amazing. magical vegetable has been mm -hmm. hybridized over the course of thousands of years. And thus you've got literally chilies that are, you know, as big as, as, big as my hand wow. and, and can be incredibly potent and fiery sometimes down to like incredibly small ones that are, you know, just a millimeter or two in size and are some of the most potent chili hot um, chilies that you've ever yeah. eaten in your life. But here's the thing, probably three quarters of the chilies that are eaten in Mexico are eaten yeah. dried, not fresh. So they've been ah, sunk okay. dry because Mexico City yeah. does not have a place where like Bali, where, you know, so close to the equator there, you can mm -hmm. grow things year round here in Mexico City. And in, in Mexico in general, traditionally, you'd have a chili growing season. And so when the chilies are fresh, you eat fresh ah, chili. But yeah, when, yeah. when, you know, you need to preserve your harvest so you can eat them year round, you dry them in the mm. sun. And thus you've yeah. got the most incredible Mexican dishes that have evolved out yeah. of that, where, where the cook okay. adds three or four different varieties of dried chilies and what they wow. do is they yeah. toast the yeah. chilies either directly over an open flame or on a traditional vessel known as a comal which is a flat griddle usually made of clay or yeah. metal and you toast the chilies but you can easily do it also in the teflon skillet yeah but so the, the 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 cook is using these three or four or five different varieties of dried chilies she's toasting them and then she's wow. rehydrating them into water in in warm water wow. and then she's pul pulverizing them either with a mortar ah, and pestle wow. what's called mm. a mojete in mexico or in a blender along with other mm -hmm. ingredients aromatic ingredients that are usually similarly toasted on the grill until they're almost slightly black. I mean, this is the essence of Mexican cooking. Mm. And that, yeah. you know, you're not really going to find in Tex-Mex cooking. Delicious. No, though right. it, yeah, true, true. You know, uh -huh. yeah, true, true. This, this ancient, multi-layered, yeah. just fascinating, mm. fabulous cuisine. And, you know, that's the mm. idea 
with World Food Mexico mm. City is that we, in makeable recipes, capture mm -hmm. that essence, that true essence of Mexicanness to the viewer. I'm sorry, to the yeah. reader. I'm thinking yeah. viewer because we're viewing <laughs> each other right now in the world of food. Here's yeah. the world of food being passed. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> True, true. Uh, so did you did you ever eat something and think, oh my god, that tastes Indonesian? Was there any a point where you felt there was an incredible well you know, over of flavors or dishes? Like I was saying, I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've been so many places all over the world. What I'm so excited to represent in this series mm -hmm. is not only how different the world's cuisines are, but how wonderfully and strangely similar they are, how connected they are. There's almost something like, maybe there's something in the yeah. basic human wiring yeah. that like, you know, we have different mm -hmm. ingredients that we're working with and maybe we slightly, you know, we, yeah. we treat those ingredients slightly different than they do over there. But there are so many more mm -hmm. similarities than there are differences. And in fact, it's you know, weird. one of the really amazing ones um, that you'll find in Mexican cooking and traditional Mexican cooking that you've also yeah. got over in Indonesia, throughout Indonesia, is that is that desire for that kind of funky ocean taste that that umami of yeah. dry <laughs> shrimp which is in fact oh yeah yeah mm. that is very common in mexican cooking um yeah that's shrimp. amazing yeah and it's used almost mm. in identical fashion yes. as it is really yeah. throughout southeast asia and i mean mm -hmm. who knows why that happened i mean maybe there was some point of literal exchange but I doubt yeah. it. I think that, you know, the coastlines in both of these places mm, have always had, yeah. shrimp, have had shrimp and the peoples of those places have always wanted to eat shrimp and, you know, hey, let's dry them. We extend them. Yeah. We can travel with them. And here, even at 8,000 feet in the mountains, like I am in Mexico yeah. City, we can taste mm -hmm. the coast through dried shrimp, you know? Yeah, true, so, true. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's that's uh, one really interesting ingredient um, and one of my favorites, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm still on the food writing sort of thread. Um, who are your favorite food writers? You know, um, I, you know, grew up reading Elizabeth David. And mm -hmm. Elizabeth David okay. made a great impact, the English... Um, food writer who really captured, um, you know, her, her main focus was the Mediterranean, um, North Africa, all the way through the Levant, mm -hmm. and then, you know, um, Southern Western Europe and Greece. That was largely what, what she gave us in her books. But she also wrote about, you know, the food of, of, of England, the really excellent mm -hmm traditional native food of England, you know, before there were cans of, mm -hmm. of peas, you know, that dominated the cooking <laughs> scene. There was this really, really excellent tradition of country cooking. Mm -hmm. and cooking. Yeah. She really made an impact on me, but so yeah. did James Beard. Um, very, uh, very, very yeah. much. I, mean, I had this James mm -hmm. Beard volume um, with me okay. that I, I carried like a Bible <laughs> through my, you know, I got it around the age I was, I guess I was 12. And, you know, I cooked my way through that book and it, it mm -hmm. really, 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 okay. really changed me. You know, mm, those yeah. were definitely two of my favorites. I mean, there are so many excellent um, yeah, young workers true. these days yeah. too, <laughs> who capture not only, you know, you know, ingredients and a kind of journalist account of, of, of cooking, journalistic account of food and cooking, but also the larger culture surrounding that. There's a really excellent um, writer in the United States named Tony Tipton Martin, who um, has written so much yeah. about you know, the importance of Africa to the cooking of the United States. And, yeah. you know, that's something that's just so thrilling to read about. Yeah. And then also mm -hmm. so exciting to figure out, you know, how to make that in one's own kitchen. Again, going yeah, back to that, that glorious yeah. 
that glorious exchange that we can do in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. We were, I mean, we were talking the other day about Madame Jeffrey and um, I was saying how she told me that when she goes to any place, she tries as much food as she can, hard to believe because she's like a sparrow, but, um, but she said it gives her um, a reference point of the flavors of a place. And I was thinking mm-hmm. about that too. Yeah, when I was first uh, living in Bali, a lot of the times I'd eat the local food and I had to add, lemon juice to it and then I thought oh I think because maybe from where I'm from we're used to slightly more sour food I mean is that something that you do when you travel you taste all the different food and just try and get a sense of their whole cuisine through that well absolutely one million percent everything you're saying you know what what I was mentioning before about translating Senora Vicky's uh, recipe that she she made up in Tepito, you know, what's important is to figure out, like, what's going on there? How yeah. do we <laughs> translate that exact thing that she made for us to the cook in, to the cook in Chicago, Illinois, or even the cook in Singapore, or the cook in Paris, France, or in Brooklyn? How do we bring the taste of Senora Vicky's kitchen into our own homes. And so that's my job, you know, really, you know, all, all, all of these recipes in this yeah. in World Food Mexico City, the, all of them were tested a minimum of 10, 11 times, some as many as 15, 16 wow. times. When we had a tricky, when we had wow. something tricky going wow. on with it, something where it was like, no, that's not right. That's not exactly how it tastes. We, our yeah. job, my job as mm-hmm. the creator of the series is to not corrupt, the, give a corrupted version of the taste of a dish, but instead to give the reader and the maker of the recipe the most authentic yeah. version of it that they, they can possibly experience. And you know, Madhur Joffrey, mm. she is definitely yes. in my pantheon <laughs> of food writers that have influenced me. She would mm-hmm. also be someone I was, you know, checking out in my local library, the Madhur Joffrey yeah. Indian cookery book. And, yeah. you know, it, she opened me mm-hmm. up to understanding the flavors of India, a place that I had the great pleasure to eventually yeah. live in. And even better, she's somebody that I know yeah. personally. She's a dear, dear friend. And I'm going to tell you, when you eat food in Madhur's, from Madhur's kitchen, in Madhur's, oh house, God. Madhur's table, Oh my God. It is oh just startling yeah. <laughs> because it's like suddenly it's like, oh my God, <laughs> this is Gujarat on the table in front of me because she's got an awareness of that Gujarati curry. It's a, a state in the, yeah. in the west of India that, that really has spectacular mm-hmm. cuisine. And I've had the luck to eat Gujarati yeah. dishes yeah. in Madhur's kitchen before where it's like she's got it all going on she's got exactly what she was telling you about she's an icon everyone yeah. needs to meet her and know her she's the best of the best she's gorgeous um so yeah what about uh, the multinational food industries um how are they affecting the way that we eat right now well i think that's a great question and i think it underlays um, you know, so much of the work that, you know, I've, I've done for years, honestly, mm-hmm. is also because I travel a lot. One of the things that I see all over the world, in Indonesia, in throughout Southeast Asia, throughout Latin America, in the United States, where I'm from, Western Europe, North Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that I see over and over is um, a threat um, um, to the old ways, to the old ways of cooking traditional Mm -hmm. dishes by modernization and by, you know, an increasing um, dependence that we find um, in the developed world, in the third world, the so-called third world, on foods that come mm-hmm. from factories and not foods that come from fields and that are, you know, ingredients that are brought to markets and then transformed into yeah. local dishes by local cooks 
but instead we're seeing the same foods in the same supermarkets and yeah. they're full of the same flavorings and foods that aren't necessarily good for our bodies and increasingly you know young people in villages teenagers in villages female and male as well depending on the part of the world that you're in aren't learning the dishes yeah. of their grandmothers in the way that even their mm -hmm. mothers were learning and yeah. i mm -hmm. think that right now at this moment in human history it's a moment where we need to wake up and get yeah. back in the kitchen and really pay attention to the old ways of doing things the local ways mm -hmm. of doing things yeah. where mm -hmm. there's not only a local flavor using local ingredients by way of local businesses, but there's something about culture and who we are. The food here in Mexico City tastes a specific way, is a specific way because it is Mexico City. And the same, of course, yeah. can be said in yeah. Bali. We're not homogenous culture where everything just comes to us by way of the supermarkets and we clip off you know, open bags of frozen food and we're experts at reheating food, food in the microwave. Yeah. But instead that, mm -hmm. you know, we're really, we, we're, we're waking up not just to, you know, those, those of us who are lucky enough to have access to fine artisanal ingredients, but to the preservation yeah. of local food cultures. And I see a kind of urgency in that business because as time goes on, I mean, gosh, I don't know how many more years I have in me, but yeah. I've seen so many <laughs> profound yeah. transformations in the last 40 years that I've been a world traveler that, you know, it's, it's a concern, honestly, it's a concern. And so I'm, I want to do my part to acknowledge, you know, the mm -hmm. old way. But in a, yeah. in, a, in a massive sweeping way yeah. by the book series. So, I mean, um, in reference to COVID right now, um, and certainly in Bali, you know, conversations have been around uh, the food industry here and um, I guess the preservation of uh, food or developing a stronger food industry. Um, Maybe that is what you're talking about. Maybe even Bali of the future needs to be looking more at its uh, food culture and, and how to survive uh, on that level. What do you think about that? Hey, listen, I mean, I grew up in, you know, baby boomer <laughs> suburban California in the 1960s and 70s. And, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. I, as I mentioned, had you know, the great advantage of having a father who was in love with cooking and, you know, he would make sauerbraten and he would translate the dishes of Western Europe in our, in our suburban kitchen. And that was very meaningful. But by and large, mm -hmm. I grew up eating supermarket food and eating fast food. And when I was a kid, my dream yeah. birthday dinner every single year was McDonald's, a meal at McDonald's. <laughs> family and we'd sit in the car and we'd eat it that was my dream so you know I'm a product of that but you know before I came along the United States of America had local and regional food traditions that were based on that particular place based on what grew there based on the kinds of people that lived there and what their traditions were based on the landscape and the environment was this a warm place or was this a place that really got hit by hard by winter and thus there were great traditions of canning and preserving yes, food. Yeah. you know but yeah. in my lifetime and preceding my lifetime that was basically kind of taken away yeah. from America it exists though it exists in fabulous pockets yeah. but it's not yeah. a large part of the American cooking vernacular anymore in in the way that it was Certainly, you know, 75 years ago or 100 years ago be before, you know, yeah. supermarkets rose up in yeah. the United States after World War II and yeah. really took over. Yeah. Basically, mm. that storyline is happening yeah. 
all over the all over the world, not just the United States anymore. And so it's it's my yeah. idea that local taste, the way you know, for yeah. example, that dish that I was describing that a Mexican cook would make with those yeah. four different mm -hmm. dried chilies and she grinds them and the yeah. way that really tastes like Mexico and it's local ingredients although PS it turns out that in 2020 Mexico a lot of the chilies that are that are eaten here are grown in China and so it really there's a movement in Mexico to grow Mexican chilies in Mexico for the Mexican mm. consumer and for export as well. But Mexican chilies, where, where chilies come from, grown by Mexicans. And I think that, you know, that's something that's very, very exciting. Being a part of global culture is amazing. What an extraordinary gift we have by yeah. way of the internet, by way of being able to travel all over the wor world with relative ease nowadays. But I think the idea of paying attention to what's right underneath our feet right now, right here, mm -hmm. what's the season here? When is a tomato actually really in season? It's not something yeah. I, I really should be eating year round unless the tomato that I'm eating has been flown in for, my yeah. God, 10,000 miles. You know, what, 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 when are tomatoes really good where I live from this soil? And I think that, you know, starting with ingredients, but also thinking about ways of cooking in traditional styles and honoring traditional styles of cooking and, and adapting them to the modern world. Hey, I'm the, you know, James who grew up going to McDonald's <laughs> for my birthday dinner. So it's like, I do not pass judgment. I do not pass judgment. Shortcuts are okay, but uh -huh. dependence on shortcuts is not yeah. And so yeah. I'm excited about getting cooks to cook, yeah. to learn yeah. new ways of cooking that are in fact based on really old ways. Old ways. And yeah. how exciting is that? And yeah. believe me, the, the more you understand these ways, which are honestly really easy, they're not really complicated. Anybody can do them. And that's another thing yeah. I wish to portray very much in my series. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what a great and exciting thing is, is it to be able to do that for yourself and the people you love. You know, it's a lot better than opening yeah, a bag of frozen food, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I totally agree. So, um, James, thank you so much for this lovely conversation. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And tell us, uh, your book is already released, the Mexico one, is that correct? World Food Mexico City comes out on November 26th. That's our launch day. Oh, okay. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. been... The first two volumes were six years in the making, and you know I'm I'm very excited about this series. Fingers, fingers crossed that that we will that we will thrive for many volumes to come, and that that people will be interested yeah. in positive messages about the world and and its wonderful yeah. inhabitants that we uh, that yeah, we want to share. Fantastic. Well, I certainly look forward to, to reading that. I cannot wait. I want to see all those amazing recipes. So thank you so much and uh, all the best of success with all your wonderful endeavors. We'll see uh, you in you Bali. So oh, my goodness. I wish it could be tonight. <laughs> I miss <laughs> Bali so much. It's so great to be here, yeah. Jan. Thanks so yeah. much. Thanks so much. Bye, James. Ciao, Bye. Ciao.